good morning, and uh, thank you very much uh, for having us. Um, yeah, good morning. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to talk about um, museums and the fiction, um, and the need of the, for the artists to reclaim fiction as an exclusive domain, and uh, about decolonizing our mind, and um, we're going to start about the Nefertiti hack, our uh, last project, and we're going to end to talk about our upcoming project, which we called uh, currently uh, Fossil Futures and discussing extinction and extraction. Yeah. And we're going to start with a short video and we're also going to end uh, with a video and we will have leave some time in the end for questions and discussion because we love it. Okay. It's the bust of the Egyptian queen Nefertiti, which sits in a museum in Berlin rather than in the vicinity of its creator. So the bust of Queen Nefertiti is a 3,000 year old work of art that was found in Egypt by German archeologists. In 1912, who discovered the house and the workshop of the sculptor, a man named Thutmose. Currently, it's in a museum in Berlin with limited access to the public. Basically, there are no photos allowed. And for years, Germany and Egypt have fought over its rightful location, and the officials even claim that she was illegally stolen. Now, the Egyptians would love to have that bust back, but the Germans have guarded it jealously, even banning photographs. So it is pretty amazing that two artists have succeeded in taking a full 3D scan of the bust. Here they are, secretly scanning back in October last year. So two artists secretly 3D scan the bust and release the files to the public as a free download. Although museums have already scanned Nefertiti's bust, they actually don't plan to make it public, which seems kind of backwards because there's a lot of museums around the world that are hosting scanathons. That's where they let people use their smartphones to take a bunch of pictures of things, objects, and to make 3D scans of them. Now, it sounds a bit like Ocean's Eleven or one of these movies. What I don't understand is, I mean, this thing is obviously guarded, right? And you must have been there for, what, a few hours? And yes. how did you not get caught? I mean, what were you, how did you disguise yourself? This is like pirate 3D printing, folks. So we thought we would download the file and 3D print it ourselves on our 3D printer. We're amazed just how much detail was captured in the model. I mean, every little crack, chip, and scratch is fully visible, which is no surprise because the mesh has a whopping 9 million polygons. It's so detailed that if you throw it in your slicing software, it'll probably crack. Short summary, so we don't have to explain all this, uh, um, and we can uh, directly start. I'm terribly sorry that I'm not a native speaker, so I will go through my script here. <laughs> and um, But first of all, we brought, as well to you, um, some data. You can download it here. It's uh, If you're interested in it's a precious uh, um, high-density polygon mesh, which is free now for everyone to use in a public domain. And, and it's not long, longer a monopoly of the Neues Museum in Berlin, where the artifact is until today, and where the data has been stored for eight years and not been shared uh, publicly. Um, we felt we came to a point where we must reclaim the museum as a public space again, and that's why we saw the need to steal something to oppose the dominant and state-funded narrative. Um, the media named it civil disobedience, a gesture of clear defiance to institutional order or the most ethical art haste. So we were, so, um, were the, so what were the reaction? We were leaked, when we, when we leaked the data at the Chaos Communication Congress, Europe's largest hacker, hacker convention, we didn't know if the public was actually interested in accessing, studying, printing, or remixing the data. Now we know what happens if you activate the artifact. There were thousands of downloads within one day and countless remixes, as you see on these slides, small um, examples. The piece went viral along with all the issues we were referring to. And there's a cover, and it there were there was sorry, and there was coverage on every continent, which means there is certain relevance of any kind of artifact, no matter how ancient, and that the public wants to reclaim 
objects as cultural commons. There was something what is uh, there was something else to the non-tangible object. Two months before we released the data on the hacker convention, uh, we uh, physically repatriated the bust back to where it was found. But before we exhibited the authentic 3D print in Cairo, in order to open the discursive space in Egyptian, we released a video, you can see here, um, where we staged, uh, where we staged um, a second find of the, uh, of the bust of Nefertiti. Who have, um, the possibility of such a find isn't completely unlikely because it can be assumed that the sculptor Tupnosis 3,000 years ago had created several busts. In order to create certain impact with this story, we consulted uh, Dr. Monica Hanna, Egypt's most renowned um, Egyptologist when it comes to fight against illicit trading of antiquities. She advised us how to stage such a find. It was he, uh, it was she who published the video for the first time on Twitter, asking the question, what if another head of Nefertiti had would have been found. That created a vivid debate, also because after weapon and drugs, antiquities are the th third largest illegal market in the world, with more than six billion euro estimated according to UNESCO. The fetishization of sacred staged artifacts and the disnification throughout the gift shops of our museums is producing capital value for illicit trading and looting of artifacts. When we exhibit, exhibited the 3D print in Cairo, um, the object was not the object was uh, not a strict copy as a perfectly perfectly painted replica, which only mimics the original, but it showed a cultural storage which doesn't try to conceal its origin as a technical reproduction, but embrace the value of the inherent information without the colonial patina. After the exhibition, our, after the exhibition, our art artistic undertake, undertaking was an open end, pointing towards an fortunity and we buried the bust in the Sahara, in, in the outskirts of Cairo, as a po poetic counteract to the excavation. We delivered it back to the desert as a locality, as a utopos. As a kind of a techno heritage, as it was called in the media too. Um, we believe, due to our experience with the Nefertiti hack, that copies are now slaves to the originals. A new discussion on the originality and truth of data, as well as material objects of other cultures, is necessary. Because in the end, one concludes that the institutional practice of today's museums and collections all around the globe are corrupted. The institutions are role models of hierarchies. Um, The museum's telling fictional stories, sometimes even without realizing it. Um, their stories, um, because uh, they so far control the artifacts by the way of representation. Frankly, the museum is a cultural institution, are power structures. They were constructed to show the power of a country, whereby possessing things and objects from all over the world was likely possessing the world in a quite literal way. Following, following Baudrillard's thought, we could sense this notion until today, um, and we think of the um, huge cultural real estate project in Berlin, Berlin right now, it, um, the Humboldt Forum, currently in the making, mixed with a great deal of inherent institutional self-preservation. Museums serve 
an ideological role by separating artifacts from their origin and depriving people of their historical memory in presenting the history of the others from a truly scientific standpoint. So um, we learned that the institutions cling to their role as gatekeepers towards cultural objects um, and its data, actually. And uh, it seems that the changing conditions by digital media has created um, what we call rather an institutional angst of losing control and, of course, relevance. So here you can see um, it's unfortunately only in German um, what was the reaction of the um, museum itself. Uh, I guess, let me see. I'm going to talk about this later a little bit more. Um, yet there was, in the first few months, there was no reaction at all. Just after New York Times was requesting um, for a quote on this project, several months later, um, there was a press release, which you can see here, um, very much making visible this institutional angst. Just a second, I have to adjust this. So the other Nefertiti has otherness in its title, and we related a lot um, to this disputing question of representation of other cultures in Western museums and colonialism itself. Because one can't find a reflection about violent entanglement of the museums and their inherent colonial patina inside the museum. But isn't like representing the other always violent, like Edward Said asked? So by publishing the data set of the Nefertiti on a public domain, the question of ownership dissolves, at least in the digital realm. But this is no substitute whatsoever to a comprehensive debate on the colonial past and presence, which is yet to be discussed um, in Europe's Germans and the Global North Museum, and all over the place, actually. So by exhibiting the 3D printed bust in Cairo, we directly touched um, the issue of repatriation, but more important than actual repatriation is a change of mindset within Western museums. That updates their, I have to say, supremacist point of view, namely their belief that it's only them who have the capacity to safeguard, preserve, and research the objects. And we used, um, as Barry also mentioned in the beginning, the phrase cultural commons extensively, because especially in the field of culture, one cannot allow it to become sheerly commodified. Yet this is exactly what happens often, and public museums even are in favor of capitalizing their collections due to a lack of funding. In the case of Nefertiti, the head in the gift shop, for example, a copy is sold for ni around 9,000 euro per piece. And uh, yeah, that's quite something, I guess. And this is where the problem lies, and what we needs to be renegotiated re by the public. And we either value culture again or drift into kind of a meaningless era. So what we truly believe, after all this uh, criticizing of museums, that they actually have the potential to be relevant spaces for a society and discourses, but also that in order to achieve that, they have to move on and reinvent themselves. And a change, of course, doesn't necessarily come from the inside. Also, us, the artists, and the public actively needs to reclaim the museums as a public space. space. So we are talking, of course, especially about public museums. So in our practice, we look at technology to try to figure out the emancipatory potential, which can be like also crowdsourcing of, of knowledge or bringing up alternative canons and narratives, and the perspective of the digital as a so social practice and cultural technique. Because so far, all around the Western world, we see plenty of small-scale um, digitization experiments coming and going, but where museums doesn't, don't really risk much. Just very few of these experiments also articulate a deal um, or deal with the bias of technology, which we regard as crucial as well. The majority of people and experts are not aware that technology is not neutral, but socially shaped. Yet, especially when we look at colonial context, this needs to be addressed and reflected. So in our upcoming project, um, where parts of it will be in Tanzania, this is an image from the place, Tendaguru, and we, we can talk about this later a little bit more when we have time in the discussion. We will make use um, of augmented reality due to several reasons. First of all, the preference of mobile technology in East Africa is remarkable. And in addition, a AR is not fully absorbed by the traditional categories of Western culture 
and thus is without an inherent cultural bias itself. So this yeah, technology facilitates in the best case a not yet colonized tool of communication and um, mediation. Um, the ubiquity of the new media in terms of perception has almost no geographical limitations. You can access anything, anywhere. Yet any new media derives from a particular locality with its idiosyncrasies of their culture of origin. Nevertheless, all of that is not about an indigenization or a romanticized view of innovation and technology, rather about emancipated narratives and explorations of the digital and art. The aim of the museum should be to go beyond the predominantly Western capitalist view that, I quote, a site is a business. This, what we try to promote in our practice is to create new and meaningful platforms of re or presentation of the subaltern instead of echoing the conventional, this term I borrowed from Siraj Rasul, yet vicious museum and to admit that objects in the museums are actually political ob objects. But then again, who has access to that kind of technology? Who has the time to dig into it? This is all a conversation mostly happening inside privileged societies or even specific classes in those societies, and that is what is kind of disturbing about it. We are like in an age where words like empathy or disruption, for sure you hear it every day here in San Francisco, are appropriated by large corporations and where exactly these corporations partner up with our public museums and um, eventually profit. Um, and eventually profit from the collections of the public museums in an economic way and use the digital assets of the museums because some parts of technology are still ju just um, too expensive, too far away to be upscaled. And indeed, they are so fancy that it's just the industry enjoying a few people paying a lot for devices, gadgets, like this um, VR experience recently created in the Berlin Natural History Museum. To us, this, um, what you can see here, bringing, in this case, dinosaurs to life, means that the exhibited objects are dead in the first place, doesn't it? Or the example of the mummy, treated as a mere object. <laughs> the mummy kind of treated as a mere object of science, in this case. Is it really okay to scan and digitize these human remains and exhibit them just like that, without any commentary or anything else? So we, the museums as we know them are dead. They host dead objects, so for a passive, consuming, entertained audience. This museum's practice to us seems fairly anachronistic. And we are using the term decolonizing quite a lot, so it seems worthwhile bringing up here a glimpse of Franz Fanon's elaborations about it. For Fanon, and I quote, struggles for decolonizations are first and foremost about self-ownership. They are struggles to repossess, to take back, if necessary by force, that which is ours unconditionally and as such belongs to us. So this decolonization, it's not a comfortable process. And in our practice, we actually go to the places outside Europe and do the interventions there as an act of what is called recentering, referring to Ngugi Vationgo. So it is about rejecting the assumption that the modern West is the, the central root of the world's consciousness and cultural heritage, or even the place of universality. But of course, the same standard takes effect for artists as well, where one can, can observe the criticality in crisis, along with an art professionalization, which isn't conducive at all, and what um, Susanne Leib called, um, you can see here, invited criticality, the collaborations between artists and museums, which eventually only re-emphasizes the legitimacy of the institutions. Think of the ethnographic collections, which nowadays regularly invite artists to work with their collections. Um, to summarize at this point, we see technology as a potential reformatory tool, which can either reaffirm existing power structures and accelerate the neoliberal attitude of museum practices, or liberate and support more inclusive and respectful structures. And in the end, what we are mostly interesting interested in when talking about museums as an instrument for the self-display of um, democratic and pluralist societies. So we are happy to talk a little bit more um, later on, on on what exactly we are now planning in Tanzania in the following discussion if we have more time and as promised also in the beginning we want to close with this video. 
It's uh, some remixes of the data we found in the internet of the Nefertiti hack. <laughs> 